Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this discussion focused on how we can bring high-end garments uh, to the digital world. Uh, I am indeed Nick Blunden. I am the president of the Business of Fashion, and it's such a pleasure to be up here moderating uh, this discussion with such an extraordinary group of speakers. So before I ask each of the speakers to introduce themselves, I just wanted to take a couple of minutes to give you a bit of wider context on the virtual fashion opportunity. Now, I think it's fair to say that the hype that surrounded virtual fashion and NFTs in 2021 has cooled a little bit. That said, I think it's still clear that the virtual fashion opportunity is transformational. As many of you will know, in 2021, the value of virtual goods sold in US dollars was 110 billion. In 2024, that's likely to increase to some 135 billion. And some 30% of that can be attributed to virtual fashion. Of course, not all of that is Web3 or blockchain orientated. A big driver of the growth of the virtual fashion opportunity is gaming. Indeed, in 2022, Roblox, according to their own data, had uh, more than 11 and a half million creators designing more than 62 million clothing and accessory items on their platform. So 25% year on year increase. And of course, in the gaming space, when it comes to virtual fashion, it's not just about Roblox. So in uh, last year, Matthew Ball, who wrote a very famous book about the metaverse, um, tweeted a now infamous chart which compared the sales performance of Epic Games, the creator of Fortnite, with leading fashion brands. The chart showed that Epic Games in 2019 made something like 3.8 billion in sales, most of which came from uh, skins, uh, the sale of skins in Fortnite, and compared that with Prada, which made 3.6 billion in 2019 in total sales. That led Matthew Ball to ask the question, should we consider Epic Games to be one of the world's largest apparel companies? But beyond just the gaming environment, the number of fashion brands getting involved with NFT projects has also exploded in the last 12 months. Uh, we've seen significant drops from luxury powerhouses like Givenchy, Gucci, and Prada, alongside successful drops from Web3 startups like uh, DressX and Artifact. In this context, our own research in the business of fashion in partnership with McKinsey for the State of Fashion Report suggested that fashion brands who invest significantly in Web3 and metaverse technologies could expect to see something like 5% of their total sales coming from virtual goods over the next five years. And if you look out beyond five years, I think there's a compelling argument to suggest um, that the opportunity around virtual fashion over the next 10 years is at least as big as the opportunity that fashion has derived out of e-commerce over the last 10 years. So it's a huge opportunity. But of course, with anything like this, there are also some skeptics. Fashion industry um, has people who believe that this opportunity is overplayed. They believe that the technical limita limitations will hold back mass adoption, and therefore the opportunity, certainly in the short term, is not as big. And they look at Experiments like meta, uh, metaverse, the inaugural Metaverse Fashion Week that happened last year, the technical limitations there as evidence that when it comes to the luxury end of the fashion industry, there are significant challenges in bringing the high-end brands and craftsmanship to life in the digital space. So there's plenty for us to discuss, and that's why I'm so delighted to have this amazing panel. So what I'm going to ask, first of all, is each of our panelists just to introduce themselves in 60 seconds or less bit of a challenge. Um, Steffi, starting with you, tell us a little bit about you. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to our talk. I'm Steffi Fung. I'm a digital fashion designer. I create digital fashion garments and also digital fashion wearables in AR. So that is what I do currently. If I'm not creating NFTs, I also work with brands and clients such as Dell, Gucci, and Glenfiddich. That's the last one. And I suppose I'm also some sort of content creator because digital fashion is such a new industry and there's not much education about it. So for me, being in this space, 
I'm just showcasing what I'm doing on social media, showing my project, showing what, like, what work I do in the digital fashion space. And I'm all over the social media for that. And aside from doing all of that, I'm also trying to build my own digital fashion brand as well. Thank you, Steffi. Jeremy, over to you. Hello, my name's Jeremy Muras. Um, so I guess I come from the more traditional side of uh, the, the internet these days, sort of the Web2 world. My background is, is e-commerce. Uh, I started at uh, a brand called Asian Provocateur uh, back in London uh, a number of years ago. I moved on to Burberry where I spent eight years working with an incredible group of people under the leadership of Angela Ahrens to really transform digital uh, luxury, the luxury brands sort of presence within, uh, within digital. Uh, after that, I, I took a little foray across the Atlantic to LA and spent five years in private equity before coming back to Givenchy as chief digital officer where I look after uh, all omni-channel data, CRM, innovation, uh, digital marketing, uh, and a bunch of other things. And we've been uh, fortunate enough to have great support in this space from our creative director, Matthew Williams, uh, who is a true believer in, in everything that we can do here. And so, and we'll come on to speak about, we've had the opportunity to do a couple of projects now um, and are continuing to explore this space uh, more and more. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Megan, over to you. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Megan Casper. I am founding member of Bread Dow. Um, we are a group that collectively invests together in um, the opportunities around digital fashion. We're actually an investor um, and big supporter of Steffi Fung and all of her designs. Um, we're most notably known for three of our purchases of the nine items that Dolce & Gabbana dropped. They were the first couture uh, NFTs that were dropped on a blockchain from a luxury fashion designer. And we own, one of them is the most expensive digital fashion NFT, and it's the Doge crown. It's quite beautiful. Um, I've also been an investor in the crypto blockchain space since 2012. I primarily do that through um, First Light and a lot through Red Dow. Thank you so much, Megan. And last but not least, Florent, over to you. Hi, everyone. So my name is Florent. I'm, I'm a co-founder of Skinvaders. Uh, we are basically in the middle of uh, 3D creators and brands. Uh, we are building a platform that helps to speed up integration into virtual worlds. Um, prior to that, I co-founded uh, another project in digital fashion as well um, called InRift where we used to link digital wearables to actual physical experience. Um, and I'm also a kind of strong believer in the future of skins uh, that will be one day overcome the production of physical uh, uh, fashion, I think, so yeah. Great, thank you so much. As you can probably imagine, I have a long, long list of questions that we could discuss, uh, but we only have 22 minutes, so I'm gonna jump right in, and Steffi, I'd like to start with you as a creator. It seems in the Web3 space, starting with the creator side is, is a good place to start. So you don't come from a fashion background particularly. So I'm interested to know what attracted you to the digital fashion space, the NFT space, and what you think is the most interesting things that are going on this, in this space from a sort of creator perspective. Yeah, so I come from a graphic design perspective. I studied graphic design, I moved into 3D. I, my dream maybe three years ago was to be a 3D motion designer in advertising. But that all changed during 2020 when I started learning digital fashion because digital fashion is essentially it's 3D. And so the jump from being a 3D motion designer to a digital fashion artist, it wasn't too far. And what I had to learn, especially not coming from a fashion background, was all the fashion terms, because the programs that I use to create digital fashion are based off real life t uh, fashion terms and fashion sewing and patterns and all those terms. I had no clue. So that was my challenge. But the reason why I got into digital fashion was because I was able to express myself in ways I couldn't do in the real world with real fashion. So. With fashion in general, it's all about self-expression, your confidence, the way you carry yourself, your character. And I felt that kind of freedom within digital fashion. And you know, for me, it was the best thing because I can make a whole outfit on my computer. I wouldn't need to you know, waste materials. I wouldn't need to go to manufacturers. I wouldn't need to find fabrics. And I could change the colors within a click of a button. So for me, that was really freeing. It was really fun as well. So in terms of that, that's the main reason why I got into digital fashion. The second thing would be the technology side. I'm an absolute tech head. I love where digital fashion is heading right now. Sure, there are current limitations with technology, but it's gonna get better in the future. 
I specifically love the way that digital fashion can be worn with augmented reality. That's something I'm really passionate about and I wanna actually do more of. I, I like the fact that with digital fashion, the accessibility of it, you can, well, especially with a filter, you can let anyone try the outfit. And I feel that, you know, it, there's no restrictions with it. Amazing. Stephanie, you, you, Stephanie, it doesn't feel from what you've said that you felt that not having a fashion background held you back in any way. I don't think so. No, no. I, I, I'm a learner, that's for sure. I don't think it's too late to learn anything or to go into whatever industry you guys want to go to. So um, I'm not afraid to start learning now. I'm, by all means, I still got lots to learn about the fashion industry, but it's, it's, a, it's a fun way for me to learn, but also create my practice as well. And that's what I show a lot on my social media is just my journey of learning. Amazing. Talking of learning, Jeremy, I'm really interested. I mean, you've had an incredible background, worked for a number of um, uh, incredible luxury brands. And I'm really interested in the luxury brand perspective on this NFT space. As you've said, you've, uh, with Givenchy, you've done a couple of um, things in the NFT space. What's driving Givenchy to get involved in this space? Is it to sell more product? Is it to reach new audiences? Is it to build a level of community engagement? And building on that, what have you done in this space that kind of um, links back to that purpose? Um, it's a big question, and I'll give you my personal view on it. I, I arrived in Paris uh, to work for Givenchy, which is part of the LVMH group, uh, during the pandemic. And uh, that really changed everything for, I think, most brands as they sort of thought about digital. And particularly for us, we had a new creative director. We were not able to do shows, so everything was then moved into sort of more digital realms or more video-based uh, uh, experiences. And so that really opened up the door for conversations for Matthew and I to have with some of the very interesting emerging uh, technology partners in Paris, people like Ledger, people like Aura. And um, we, we thought about the, 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 the our needs at that time for Givenchy, which really was what we called a, a renaissance project. So if you think about Givenchy's history and past, it's very based and grounded in innovation. Um, it's very based and grounded in sort of being audacious and pushing boundaries. And so with Matthew's background coming from LA and, and the way that he conceives and thinks about fashion, it, it was kind of like a natural space to begin to play with. And we had the opportunity in 21, in November 21, when we did a collaboration with a digital, uh, sorry, a graffiti artist called Cheeto, uh, which, which was actually featured on the runway, to take some of those artworks and transform those into NFTs. And, and it was very successful. And we did it you know, very, very, very on very, a very low budget, uh, but we had sort of some key principles. That was, you know, this was before the merge, so it had to be sustainable. So we worked on uh, Polygon to ensure that that was the case. And we really didn't know what to do with the money, uh, so we decided that we would give it all to charity, uh, to a charity that was very close and important to us at the time. Um, uh, so it felt right. Uh, Cheeto had done projects in this space before. It was a collaboration with an artist, which we liked, and we've continued to sort of ground our strategy in that. And so as we moved on to our second project, uh, which I'll talk about later, uh, probably it, it remained the same, a real uh, emphasis on co-creation, a real emphasis on community, a real emphasis on sort of being able to connect in an authentic way with the Web3 community. Uh, we've had lots of challenges along the way, um, uh, but it's really built up our way of thinking about what is the long-term future for Givenchy and, and, and this space, and it's really to create lasting value, uh, and that's really in three clear areas. One, in continuing to promote the brand as innovative and groundbreaking. Two, to really build, uh, well, to onboard an, a new client, a younger client who's, you know, really growing up in this space, but also then connecting our existing community. I believe really fundamentally in the earlier presentation that the wallet is going to really become the center of our lives. And so, you know, we're really starting to use our projects to enable us to connect with our community through this new form. Uh, and then the final one, of course, is is we do see a longer term opportunity for uh, revenue as, this, uh, as, a, as a new revenue stream, whether it's in gaming or, or in, in, other, in other ways. Um, I think that's a longer term opportunity for fashion, um, but you know, kind of those are the three areas that we think about. 
love to love your sort of framing of that as the multifaceted value creation because when we think about web3 i think that's the interesting the the transformational part of it is the different ways it creates value speaking of which megan i'd like to come on to you uh successful investor in this space you will have a really interesting perspective i think on how that value is being created what the sources of value are now and what excites you about where value will be created in in the future so can you just give us a sense from the kind of investment point of view what excites you most? Well, right now, digital fashion is very limited as to what we can do with it. Um, like I said, as Red Dow, we hold several different NFT digital fashion pieces, including the Doge Crown, which was purchased for over a million dollars. And we can't do much with the digital side of it now because we're very limited. Um, as Steffi was talking about AR, the AR applications, I think, will become greater as we have device disruption, um, possibly moving from a handheld to a near eye wearable. Um, also, content creation. Um, content creators, the way that they're creating now, they're not using AR. Um, some with filters, but I think that that will change a lot too. Um, and then connecting your wallet. Um, I'm really looking at uh, all the investments that we make are through companies that really enable the wallet and empower the users to use a wallet what uh, Pierre was talking about earlier, that future, I believe, I hold near and dear to my heart. Um, I think that all the world's assets globally will be tokenized. And today, you know, the crypto, uh, the entire asset class is about $1 billion, no, I'm sorry, $1 trillion, so it's half of Apple. Um, and I think that we'll, over the next 20 years, 20x, 30x that easily with the new applications that we'll be able to do and use with um, the assets inside of our wallets, including digital fashion. Great, thank you so much. Um, then from over to you, you come at this from a slightly different perspective. You're, um, in essence, I think, working on the kind of digital infrastructure that brings all of this together. I said there are, you know, certainly within the fashion industry, some skeptics. Um, one of the things that I think is challenging in this space is inter interoperability. You know, how do we make sure that, you know, what we're doing in this space works across different um, uh, iterations of the technology. Do you have a point of view on how important that interoper interoperability is and whether it's a problem that can be solved in the short term? Um, yeah, so regarding the interoperability, um, I'm a huge believer that uh, it will be more like interconnectivity uh, between uh, the several uh, virtual worlds, um, especially because the way it works today, at least that's the way that we see with brands, um, they are mainly creating like high definition rendering and then they want to realize activation in specific virtual worlds. And um, there is no yet such interoperability. So what we see is that brands are creating several versioning of the skin and what we are basically missing today is the link between a skin to another. Um, so the way I see it evolve uh, in, a, in a very short term is being able to link um, skins to another and uh, form a platform to another. Um, also, another challenge that I think um, the space will have to face is that today 3D remains very complex. So we are missing basically infrastructure in the middle uh, between 3D creators and brands because each time a brand wants to uh, realize an activation today, uh, it remains super complicated. You have to find the right 3D creators to create the garments in high definitions. Potentially, other 3D creators to do what we call a retopology. So this is going from high definition to low definition for a specific virtual game. Um, so yeah, the link between um, brands, cr creators, uh, some are missing today. And we need to have some more um, openness uh, between, uh, between the virtual worlds uh, to uh, allow us to speed up and to speed up the creation process for 3D creators and for brands to realize activation. Um, and yeah, that's me. Jeremy, I'm interested from from your sort of brand perspective. Did did that play into your thought process about where you experiment in terms of you know the the interoper interoperability piece, or are you so early in this that you're like, okay, we can afford to place some bets in different places and see what happens? We're, we're pretty early, um, but but I, I would absolutely say that where we're focusing a lot of our time is in this 3D space and AR space. And so 
you know, if you look at every product launch we now do, we make sure that we do a 3D rendering of that. Uh, so we're putting some, you know, bets down on the future. We we do show that through Sketchfab on our site, and we and I and I do think that you know once we begin to solve some of the um, uh, some of the interoperability, but also I think you know as as technology like Unreal Engine gets better. Um, and artists and creators can continue to advance, you know, the the the, the hyper realism of the, the the garments themselves. It's going to be easier for us, uh, all fashion brands, to really move into that at scale. We work with Roblox, and we have our product in there, but you know, it's it's not really something that is going to be, uh, you know, sort of really meaningful for us. It's it's something that we experiment with. We talk to people at uh, at Fortnite, and I think there's going to be a lot of very interesting things that are going there as that technology advances. And I think of you know people like Ready Player Me, and and sort of how we think about dressing avatars in the future, you know, in these different med in these different spaces. I think it's very very interesting, and I think we will absolutely be there. We just need to find the right partners, the right technology, the right creators to get us there. So we are we are we're putting bets down on the future right now. I'd say. And talking about partners and creators. Steffi, I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued. A lot of the work that you've, you've done has been in partnership, in collaboration with, with luxury brands. I noticed you've just done something with Gucci, which is really interesting. And that's a fascinating space because you have these luxury brands doing collaborations with uh, emerging creators coming from a very different world. So can you just talk a little bit about that collaboration process? How have you found it? I presume it's working well for you, but what are the challenges? Yeah, I think I'm in quite a lucky position where brands are actually reaching out to me for collaboration because there are many people where if you become a digital fashion artist or designer, you might instead just work for the brand and work for their vision. So what I really appreciate is when a, especially a big brand like Gucci or Dell or Glenfiddich, they reach out to me to collaborate, to actually utilize my style. That's when it's that's a perfect project for me, especially as a creative. So we're going to see more of that, especially because what they are utilizing is the fact that artists or creators within this space have their own community. And I think community is such a key part of NFTs, such a key part of Web3. So especially when you've got people, as in, how can I put this? People are not so much attuned to just buying brands because they're selling a lifestyle anymore. People want to know the creators behind it, know what is being made, how it's being made, who is making it. So being able to connect back. Hello? OK, sorry. <laughs> um, being authentic, I think that is you know, a key part of Web3, being authentic, the transparency, and the whole collaboration part of it is, is what is pushing uh, the space forward. Can I just say on that, because I think that, that Gucci collaboration is fantastic, and I think that's very important. I think back to where we started in social, and then we moved into sort of these social platforms and UGC, and for fashion brands and luxury brands, that was very hard for us to get our heads around, but we've had to learn it. I think this co-creation, this ability to co-create with content, but also with product, we did it a little bit with a community called Feltzine for our Bistroy project, where we really gave them the keys to the car to use a lot of the IP that we had and to really build these original assets that would resonate with the community. I think that's how brands need to start thinking about this. Uh, I don't think we're there totally yet, but I think we're starting to make really interesting inroads. And Jeremy, just on that, I think a lot of how we learn about what works in this space is by looking at things that have happened. You mentioned a second project thing when you spoke earlier. You said, I'll come back to that. Can you just give us a little bit more detail on perhaps one of the things that you've done in this space that has been mo most effective and why you think it worked? I, I was, our second project was quite ambitious, and, and, and it was very low-key again, but ambitious for us internally. We are a very small team. I can see a, a few of us here, but literally we're a tiny team. That, and so... Uh, we, we again worked with uh, Matthew and some uh, designers from New York, but also then with a community called Feltzine, uh, you know, who um, really uh, took our product and our artwork. That if, you, if you see the product, it's very sticker-based and it's very, um, uh, it's very original creative, but th took that and really layered that in a way that was quite original in, ter in terms of the NFTs, but also included uh, the 3D model. So the idea was it's a redeemable NFT, it was a digital twin, um, 
and we tried to promote that really across our omnichannel environment. So you could you could buy it, you know, you buy the product in store, you could get the digital twin, you could get it online, get the digital twin, uh, and then we really put that creative throughout our whole network. And it was very successful on that side, uh, but it also taught us a lot that I think you were saying earlier, you know, the the, the friction involved for people who aren't used to this is is very difficult. Um, uh, and uh, also that in the Web3 community, I think people are very, very, very focused on the, the digital asset, uh, you know, first and really getting that to enable them to unlock something else, which I think, of course, is right. Um, so we learned a lot. Um, uh, and I think that we realize now that some of the interesting and, and really positive things that got from it is that we actually, 48, 50% of the people who redeem the NFTs were actually existing customers. Uh, and we're actually new to the space. So I, it told me that we can, if we promote it in the right way and we connect with our, our existing customers in the right way, we can bridge that gap. And that's a word that we talk about a lot. Um, uh, you know, uh, you know. also we, we have work to do. Feltzine was a great partner, but I think you need a right, the right community at the right scale uh, to really you know, get you know, full coverage within the space. But and just in that, how important is the twinning of the physical and the digital products? Is that critical? in your view of this stage of adoption? Um, I think for a number of reasons, it's very interesting, and you're seeing a lot of people move towards that. Um, uh, you know, you think about authenticity, you think about traceability, uh, you think about uh, loyalty. Um, I think that's all important. Also, I think what we think about is the future and how we can use it in these different spaces once you have that the ownership of that asset. So I don't think it's essential. Uh, I, I think it's interesting, and uh, clearly you see people like Prada are doing some interesting work, and I like what they've done. They've stayed at it. They've continued to drop these, these digital assets. Um, they're now starting to reward that community, which I think is important, and it's sort of our next step is, is how do we work with the community that we're building. Um, I think it's important. Um, uh, I, don't, I don't know that it's essential. At the moment. There's so many different ways that I think people are going. And Jeremy, you talked about traceability, and Megan, that's a nice segue, because one of the things that's so interesting about this is the beneficial environmental and social consequences of a move to, to digital fashion. Something that gets talked about as a potential driver of growth in this space, but often less so than the technology. It's something I think you're passionate about. How important do you think that is? Yes, very, and I think we're dematerializing, and I look at it generationally. Um, I'm a millennial, I didn't grow up with a device in my hand, but if we go to restaurants, we all see children growing up with devices in their hands, and that tells you their digital identity is gonna be more important to them than their physical identity, and their fashion will be as well, in a dematerialized sense. Um, in order to get us there, though, to bridge the gap, um, I think it's, tying and connecting the physical and the digital. I think it's really hard, especially we saw a big um, movement this last uh, hype cycle in, in the crypto asset class um, around speculative assets and NFTs. And a lot of the brands get really scared. You know, you don't wanna build a, a marketing channel through NFTs, you wanna build a long-term product channel. And in order to do that, I think you tie the physical and the digital. And Allo actually did uh, their Aspen collection was a really great example of this. It was the collection physical first, and then they tied the NFT and gave that as sort of this secondary aspect just to get people used to the idea of using a wallet, having assets that are physical tied on chain. But I think over the next 20 years, that will shift very slowly and incrementally towards digital first, and people will be more focused on having um, NFT assets that are digital and that they can use it more in a digital world. Great, thank you. Flora, I just wanted to come back to you. We've talked, we've heard the phrase sort of bridging the gap quite a lot, and clearly we're early in this space. And as I said, some of the skepticism of some people is around the technology. In your view, what is the rate of technical change? How quickly will some of the frictions that are inherent in this space, from your perspective, fade away and make it perhaps easier to get to a mass adoption phase? Um, it will depend, I think, depending on the virtual world we are talking about. Um, also, I think uh, the link to, f to something physical is very important for mass adoptions. Um, I believe that um, at least that what we see with the brands we are working with, most of them are asking us uh, how we can build experience and realize activation where uh, our customer or potential customer 
by um, digital first, and then uh, they receive something physical. Um, I think this link with um, the real world, let's say, uh, is very important for smart adoption. Um, and then uh, having like tool and third parties that help to speed up the creation process or to help brands to get more stats on uh, who, by what, uh, wha did they redeem the physical products. So having analytics and tools will help a lot, obviously. Uh, so being more open, so virtual world being more open to share uh, information around um, their audience and stuff. Um, and yeah, linked to the physical world. I think it's very important and that's the key. Great, thank you. As you've probably gathered, I could sit up here and talk about this all day. Uh, you probably wouldn't like that so much, but I would love it. But uh, unfortunately, we are out of time. So please join me in thanking our wonderful speakers for their contribution this morning.